morning all of you hope all of you are in fine health today's video on nervous system continues with the completion of part e that is to finally compare both mechanisms of impulse transmission that is one along the axon and the other across the synapse to be able to complete the comparison it's best that you have gone through three of my earlier videos. That is the video on transmission of impulse along the axon, the video on synapse where I explain the transmission of impulse across the synapse, as well as the video on the function of synapse so that you are familiar with some of the terms we use when making comparisons. When we talk about comparison, it means both similarities as well as differences. So let's start off with the similarities. This is the transmission of impulse along the axon and this diagram is the transmission of impulse across the synapse. What is most apparent in their similarity is they both serve to transmit impulse. In the process of transmitting impulse, they share some similarities such as first, the influx of sodium ions. For the axon, the influx of the sodium ion is from the tissue fluid into the exoplasm, whereas for the synapse, the influx of the sodium ion is from the synaptic cleft, the space in the synaptic cleft into the dendrite. The second similarity is that the influx of the sodium will cause depolarization of both membranes, that is the membrane of the axon as well as the postsynaptic membrane. Once the sodium ions are in the axon or in the dendrite, they both cause threshold potential to form okay, and after which an action potential can be generated. Finally, we find the transmission of impulse in both axon as well as at the synapse is unidirectional. For the axon is from the cell body to the terminal axon, whereas for the synapse, it is from the synaptic knob to the dendrite. Let me now move on to the differences. Now let's have a look at the differences between the transmission of impulse along the axon and across the synapse. I show you here a list which will include factors such as the type of impulse, the depolarizing agents, the nature of the action potential, types of transport involved, the recovery of the axon and the synapse, the rate of transmission, how the axon or the synapse can be affected, the refractory periods involved, the path taken by the impulse, the reasons for it being unidirectional, and finally, the types of transmission. So based on this list and the knowledge you have acquired from the three previous videos, you could come up with the differences and then compare with my answers in this video. So let's start with the first difference. Let's start with the first difference that is based on the path taken. The transmission in the neuron is along the length of the axon. Okay, whereas for the synapse, the transmission of impulse is across the synapse that is between two adjacent neurons. For the second difference, we talk about the form of impulse. In the axon, the impulse travels as an electrical impulse due to the influx of sodium or efflux of potassium ions. Whereas at the synapse, the impulse transmission is chemical in nature. 
is made up of the neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine or norepinephrine. The third difference that is related to the rate of transmission. From the animation, you can clearly see that the rate of transmission along the axon is fast, whereas across the synapse is slow. The reason for this is because the transmission of impulse along the axon involves the influx of sodium ions via the uh, open voltage-gated channels. So this is due to facilitated diffusion. Whereas in the synapse, it is dependent on simple diffusion of the neurotransmitters down the concentration gradient. We discuss how the rate of transmission can be affected to be made faster or slower. For the axon, it can be made faster by myelination, where we have learned that myelinated neurons are able to transmit impulse faster due to saltatory conduction, whereas the unmyelinated neurons are dependent solely on a localized current that happens slower. Another factor that can help to increase the rate of impulse transmission in an axon is the diameter of the axon itself. The bigger the diameter of the axon, the higher the rate of transmission. Now for the transmission across the synapse, we cannot actually increase the rate of transmission, but the rate of transmission can be slowed down by the presence of drugs such as cocaine and curare, which will be discussed in later videos. Next, we look at the type of neurons involved. In the case of uh, axon transmission, you find that the impulse is always transmitted as long as an action potential is generated. So because of that, the axon is always considered as excitatory. That means it will always transmit impulse. However, in the synapse, there are two situations. There are synapses that will transmit impulse okay, by developing an excitatory postsynaptic potential that will become action potential and the impulse will be transmitted. Those kinds of synapses are called excitatory synapses. But we also have cases where instead of EPSP, IPSP is generated. That is inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So when an IPSP is generated, impulse is not transmitted and this is called an inhibitory synapse. So you see for the axon, there is only one type of axon that is all are uh, excitatory. But for the synapse, there can be two types of synapse. Excitatory synapse and inhibitory synapse. The next difference is related to the direction of transmission. Now we know both of them have unidirectional transmission of impulse. But let's talk about the reason why. For the axon, it is in one direction because of a localized current or what we call as saltatory conduction for myelinated neurons. Where the transmission of impulse is from the stimulated part of the axon to the unstimulated part of the axon. Likewise, in the case of a synapse, we find it is also unidirectional, but this is because one end of the synapse, that's the synaptic knob, has the synaptic vesicle, whereas the other end, that is the dendrite, has the receptor protein that will bind with the neurotransmitters. So although the similarity is that the transmission of impulse is one direction, the difference is the reason why it is in one direction. Let's move on next to the types of transports involved. This diagram shows the axon membrane where you have a few proteins. This is the 
sodium potassium pump that requires ATP. This is the sodium and potassium voltage gated channels. And this is the sodium and potassium non voltage gated channels. So from here, you can see the transports involved in transmission of impulse along the axon include active transport due to the sodium potassium pump, facilitated diffusion using the gated channels as well as the non-gated channel. Now, if we compare with the synapse, we find we do have a calcium voltage gated channel at the synaptic knob and we have sodium voltage gated channel at the post synaptic membrane okay but we also have the vesicle so the transports involved in the transmission of impulse across the synapse include facilitated diffusion due to the calcium gated channel and the sodium voltage gated channel exocytosis where we find the vesicle will fuse with the presynaptic membrane and also simple diffusion where the neurotransmitter will diffuse across the synaptic cleft to bind to the receptor protein. On to the difference related to the depolarizing agents. During the transmission of impulse along the axon, there is influx of sodium and for recovery, there is going to be efflux of potassium. So it is these two agents here that affect the membrane potential of the axon. Okay, that is both sodium and potassium function as the depolarizing agents. Now for the synapse, we have calcium influx leading to the movement of the vesicles to the presynaptic membrane after which the neurotransmitters will diffuse across the synaptic cleft to bind to the receptor protein and then this leads to the opening of the sodium voltage gated channels and influx of sodium. So from here you can see there are three agents involved that is calcium, neurotransmitters and sodium ions. Now we look at the difference related to the action potentials. For transmission of impulse along the axon, when a weak impulse is detected, there is a little bit of depolarization of the axon membrane, but the depolarization will not be strong enough to reach threshold potential, so then the impulse transmission will fail. But if a stronger impulse is detected, then the action potential increases or the depolarization increases until it is above threshold, it reaches action potential and then the impulse is transmitted. So this concept is based on the all or nothing law. It means it's as if you are given only one chance. If that stimulus can reach threshold, then the message will be passed. But if the stimulus cannot reach threshold, then the message is not passed. So that is the all or nothing law for the axon. But let's look at what happens at the synapse. At the synapse, when a impulse arrives, you find that the neurotransmitters will cause depolarization of the dendrite where EPSP will form. Now, even if the stimulus is a weak stimulus, okay, as long as the EPSP can accumulate, then the EPSP becomes an action potential and the message can be transmitted. So you find in the case of a synapse, the action potential can actually be summated. Summated means added. So it can be added either by temporal or spatial. Temporal is when the same stimulus is uh, continuously detected or spatial is when two different stimulus are detected at the same time. So next, 
we move on to the difference on how these axon or synapse recover. So the axon recovers by the efflux of potassium ions. So that is when you see the graph moves down and becomes more negative in potential. For the synapse, we find that the recovery of the synapse involves the removal of the neurotransmitter. One is by hydrolysis of enzymes. Okay. Second is by reuptake where energy is used to actively transport neurotransmitters back into the synaptic knob or by simple diffusion. Finally, we look at the refractory periods. In the case of the axon, you find that there is an absolute refractory period that lasts one millisecond and a relative refractory period that will last about five milliseconds. You have been told that during the absolute refractory period, no matter how great the stimulus is, impulse transmission will not be carried out. But during the relative refractory period, if the impulse or stimulus is very great, then an impulse can be transmitted. However, in the case of the synapse, we find there are no refractory periods. As long as a stimulus arrives, the neurotransmitters will be continued to be released. So with that, we end part E. I'll see you soon with the other subtopics. Bye-bye.